Edna and Kyra and their aunt are in Vegas right now, Ooh. celebrating Kyra's birthday. Oh, so um, they they called. She's she's doing great. She woke up before everybody else did. Gotcha. Um, they apparently got back to the hotel room about two o'clock, and then Edna texted me about eight. Says I'm up and I'm hungry. <laughs> well, of course you're hungry. <laughs> so, but but they're doing great, and um, they'll be back Tuesday and. And uh, so I'm, I'm in the house alone without adult supervision. <laughs> but I will, I will tell you how Edna's changed me, because uh, my plan was to have, since she's not there, a marathon of the Insidious movies. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> they're, they're horror movies about, yeah, it's just bad stuff. It's good, but it's, it's uh, anyway. Um, but the dog started going <laughs> all over the place. I'm like, mm-mm. So I said, hey, did you watch your horror movie yet? Well, I can't let her, well, I guess I'm letting her know now. I can't let her know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wuss, so I put on Psycho. <laughs> the, the original one. So uh, I figure it's easy to, to lock the door against Norman Bates than it is against the other stuff. So, but, uh, She has changed me, most people would say, for the better. So. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to talk to you today about um, the, the subject is God is bigger than your box. And I have notes, so um, probably uh, most of this, if you don't like it, you can cut it out, and there's still plenty of biblical verses. So um, my prayer every time I get up here, and every time anybody should get up here, is that what we speak is in accordance with God's Word. So if, if it's not, I have Bible verses here to uh, either back me up or uh, prove me wrong. So... <laughs> God is always right. Um, so anyway, God is bigger than your box. So I had a, the idea to bring in a bunch of boxes today, but um, I realized I had either thrown them away or they were left outside and they were mushy. <laughs> so in lieu of bringing mushy boxes in here, you'll just have to use your imagination. So here's a box. <laughs> it's a small one. For some people, what they think of God could fit in this little box. They have few expectations and a limited knowledge of who God is. Here's another box. That's Stark technology. Here's another box. It's a little larger. Many people would be comfortable, I'll hold it with one hand, many people would be comfortable with having God who could fit in this box. Of course, there are many things that would have to be left out, but that's satisfactory with people whose God is no bigger than that. Pick up another one. <clears throat> okay. In this box, there may be room for love and grace and mercy, but not much room for any rules or commands that interfere with the way one wants to live their life. <clears throat> Here's another box. It's bigger still. I'll hold it with one hand. I'm strong. <laughs> In this box, there is room for some love and grace and mercy, as well as some of the commands, the ones that don't get in the way. Of course, the only commands that fit are those that the person accepts that fit with their lifestyle choice. I got one more box. Okay, that's a little heavy. I'll still hold it with one hand. And here is still another box. It's the biggest of all. It can hold God's love, mercy, and grace, as well as the commands of Scripture. One can live a pretty good life with this box, but there's still something missing, and goodbye to the boxes. That's because our God is bigger than any box we might put him in. He's bigger than this room, this building, this town, this country, this planet, this galaxy, this universe. By his power, he created the universe. And by that power, we can live our lives in ways that are otherwise impossible. He tells us that whatever we face, he is able. God doesn't want to fit in our boxes. He wants to be out of any box we try to put him in because he can't fit in there. He will not conveniently confine himself to our limits and our boundaries. God is bigger than our box. Now I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21.
the Bible that I actually had the bookmarks in, I didn't bring. So I'm giving people hope here. <clears throat> 20 and 21. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than, we can, than all we can ask for or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. A God, and now there's a different translation here, a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above anything we may ask or think won't fit into any box, no matter how big we make it. There's, uh, there's, it gives this version, there's a, another version of this. It's, it's in the Easy Bible. It says, what can you imagine? How big can you think? God thinks bigger. He plans better. He accomplishes more. Already he's at work inside you and me. Do you want to ask him for something? Then ask big because you're dealing with a big God. We serve a God who is able to do things beyond what we would think impossible. The word, this is in, check this out. The word able in the Greek is the word dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. Yeah. All forms of this word have the, have the basic meaning of being able and to, or speak of power. This same word is used in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, where Paul said, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ Jesus, the way that's worded reminds us that God is continuously able. It doesn't, that power doesn't wax or wane. God's power is still at work today. What, when we face what seems to be insurmountable troubles, He has what it takes to get rid of them or take them on. The capability, the power, and the strength are all His. When I was, when I was going through my divorce and all the, the ick that happened afterward, Lisa gave me something that I still keep. It's a little plaque that says, the battle is God's, not yours. And as, as soon as I started taking that to heart, which wasn't immediately, as soon as I started taking that to heart, and things became easier because uh, he, he fights it better than I do. And I still keep that. And I think that's something everybody should either write down or scribble down or burn on their wall or something. The battle is God's, not yours. Amen. When Jesus came to this world and died on that cross, and was buried and rose again, our God took care of the world's biggest problems. Death, estrangement, and alienation. These are cosmic-sized issues that governments with all their power can't do, as well as the biggest problem we all have, sin. And if God can do that, we can know that He's able to keep us from whatever issues life throws at us. When we're in Christ, God does not work against us. God makes His power available to us through His Spirit, the Spirit that lives in us. So, when we ask God for help, He can always do more. When we think there's no hope, God has reserves of powers we can't even imagine. If we imagine that there's no way out, we haven't even begun to fully trust that we can cast our cares on Him. And the wonderful thing is that God is not some impersonal, powerful force. Yes, He has power, and yet He's not so big and powerful that He won't get personal. The God that can hold the entire multiverse in His, in his hand is also small enough to get to us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. He can do it all at once. He will do His work in each of us, and more than we can ask, think, or imagine. When facing life's issues, we need to remember how big our God is, and we need to think big. We need to remove all the stupid self-imposed limits that we place on ourselves and trust in our big God. There's a, there's a song from a few years back, and I can't find it in any of the books, I don't know, but whatever. It says, God can do anything, 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 and God can do anything but fail. There's a text, it's in the New King James Version, it says, God, 
and it doesn't cross over quite as well into other translations. But it says, God is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. With God, you can always get more than, than you expect. Yeah, other versions translate this, this in, in different ways. But the uh, NIV says, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Now, this phrase, that, uh, exceedingly abundantly above, if you think about it in the original text, um, the, the Greek, I don't want to get into all the linguistics of it, but the Greek is a little different, obviously, from ours. Paul is using a double compound word. He's actually making up his own phrase. It's kind of like saying super, super, ugh, super califragilistic expialidocious. I said it. <laughs> um, exceedingly abundantly above. That's, it, it sounds a lot bigger in the Greek. It's like he's really going out of his way to, to try to, uh, to convey God's bigness. And Paul is so caught up in the bigness and awesomeness of God that he has to create this new phrase to make his point. He stacks a couple of words upon each other in an attempt to say that God is not just big, but really, really, really big. It's like saying big, hum humongo, huge, horrific. Which, yeah, if somebody said that in the New King James Version, they'd be saying, what? Yes. Yeah. But that's what Paul's doing. Uh, to explain the ability of God to do amazing things is beyond words. So Paul, in morphing these words together, is making his point, saying God is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly incredible, extravagantly extravagant, awesomely awesome in all of his awesomenessness, outrageously outrageous, fantastically fantastical, amazingly amazing, and my favorite, infinitely infinite, all the time. What that means is all our boxes are a waste of time. And we can never hold them. We can never build a box big enough. He exceeds all expectations. The Lord not only forgives a sin, He can forgive all sin. God not only loves you when you're good, He still loves you when you're bad. God not only gives you the hope of heaven today, He's preparing heaven for you for eternity. But if God is so powerful and able to do all these wonderful things, you may ask, why does it seem that I still struggle with so many things in my life? Well, first of all, we have to understand that God works in us to accomplish His purpose. But we have to allow Him to do that. Now, he's going to do it whether we want to do it or not, but it, it works a lot easier if we step in and say, okay. God wants, us to, God wants to use us, but we must be willing. We must yield, yield our will to his and allow his power to work in us to accomplish everything that he calls us to do. And there may be another reason. James chapter 4, verse 2 reminds us, you do not have because you don't ask. So even though God is able to do more than we, and there's a whole lesson in that right there. That may be my next one. Huh? Even though God is able to do more than we ask or think, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask. Maybe our problem is when we pray, we put limits on what God can do. Too often we may think our problem and our circumstance, our situation is beyond the scope of God's ability or it's not worth his time. So we just ask a little. When we think that our problems are bigger than, than God is able or willing to handle, we show a lack of faith in the God who loves us and cares for us and says he's able. Sometimes... We actually get answers to prayers we haven't asked yet. We're reluctant to pray for things we can't imagine getting because we doubt God would do it. So when God makes the impossible a reality, we should thank Him for giving more than we dared to ask. My personal case in point is going to come true August 25th. Truthfully, 
It's a lack of faith that makes us expect far less than God is willing to do. But the Word of God is clear when it tells us to expect God to answer when we pray in faith. Have you, have you had times when you took something to God in prayer and He gave an amazing answer, something bigger than what you bigger and better than what you were looking for? Maybe it wasn't what you expected, but it was amazing nonetheless. Maybe in your own life you've experienced God doing the impossible when you thought there was no hope. When you thought the odds were against you and it was impossible or circumstances couldn't change. When you expected the worst, God stepped in and everything changed. God stepped in and did infinitely more, exceedingly abundant, all, all the other words there, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think or imagine. But the one thing we all need to learn, some of us over and over, is patience. God keeps teaching us that His timing is perfect in every situation. He will act at the right time, and He's willing to do far more than we ever ask. But it'll be in His time. When we pray, we must be humble enough to admit our helplessness. Why does Scripture point out over and over that God is able? Well, because we're not. Our problem is we're broken. We look at our powerless lives and need to be reminded of of a verse in Genesis 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? From the very beginning, he was telling people that he couldn't fit in their boxes. It's when we admit that we're powerless that we become open to God's might. Being helpless is actually good news. As soon as we admit this, God has us right where he wants us. He reaches out to the powerless. God does help those who can't help themselves. We've been disabled by sin, and yet God still loves us too much to leave us in this mess that we're in, or we're in. Admitting our powerlessness is the first step on the road to victory. We often feel we don't have the ability to live the Christian life the way God intended. And even then, God does. He's made that available to every single believer in Christ. Remember, he says it over and over. He is able. Believers, anybody actually, but believers need to get rid of the phrase, I can't. If you say, I can't love that person, I can't forgive that person, I can't change, that's just who I am. Well, you're right. You can't. I've tried. I bet you have too. But God can help you do the things you can't imagine. Now, I'm going to admit there are some things God cannot do, and it has nothing to do with moving a stone. I think we talked about that, didn't we? Um, now, don't call me a heretic. There are some things, though, God won't do. Therefore, there's, there are things He cannot do. We can argue the semantics about that all day, but it's pointless. I'm talking about such things as those which are contrary to His nature inconsistent with his will and his, uh, his purposes, that would Im imply a contradiction and be foreign to the truth. And God has said he cannot lie. Um, I'll go to Hebrews 6.18. It tells us it's impossible for God to lie. So for him to do such a thing would be the same as denying himself. And God is not going to do that. But God does have absolute power over all things that have been, are, and will be. And though these things are impossible for people, Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. For that reason, God is worthy to be glorified. And what does verse 21 say? It says, to him be the glory. It's going back to Ephesians. To him be the glory. The way it is worded it doesn't just mean to him be some glory, to him be the glory, all of it. It means to give God all the glory he deserves. There's nothing and no one higher. There's nothing and no one who's worthy of more praise, glory, and honor than God Almighty. 
And where's the primary place God wants His glory to be seen? It's within us, within the church. Not the building, but the people. To Him be glory in the church. So why should being, being part of a local church be important to believers? It's because this is where God has chosen to bring glory and honor to Himself. This is where and when believers can learn to allow God to be working in them so that He can produce godly lives through the power of the Holy Spirit and be glorified. It also says, To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. God's glory is in Christ. We need to choose to live in a way that pleases the Lord. The way we live our lives reflects back on Him. And most importantly, this glory will last forever. It says, To Him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We have a big God. So it's time to take God out of the box and let His great glory be known. Just let God be God and let God's power be at work in our lives. And do that and He will continually exceed all our expectations. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this little, little story here that I read. Uh, Martin Luther, who was a great reformer uh, in the, the Protestant Reformation, he had a good friend and assistant, Frederick Myconius. I said that right the first time, too. In 1540, Myconius became sick and is expected to die shortly. And on his deathbed, he wrote a farewell letter to, to Luther. So Luther read the message and immediately sent a reply back to Myconius. He said, I command you in the name of God to live because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. Isn't that awful? You're ready to, you're ready to die and be at peace and your friend says, nope. <laughs> oh. Uh, anyway, the Lord, he, he continues on. The Lord will never let me hear you are dead, but will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will, and may my will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. Luther prayed about that. Luther had no power to keep this guy alive. It didn't, didn't matter what his medical knowledge was or if he had TRICARE or not. <clears throat> So while these words may seem a little harsh, maybe even arrogant, Myconius, who had already lost the ability to speak, he recovered. And he lived six more years and died two months after Luther. So there may be some things in your life that seem impossible right now. But those, that verse in Ephesians chapter 3, it makes it clear that God will hear your prayer and He's exceedingly abundantly able to meet your need now in the future. And the most important thing, the most important impossible thing that God did was become flesh and take on all of our sins, take them into death, take them into hell and leave them there. And He came back and we got the opportunity to be in heaven with Him. If you haven't made that decision now, we ask you to do so and as we stand and be singing. Thank you. Please turn to 608. 608. It just ties in with Mark's sermon. A whole lot more. 608. 608. He took my burdens all away after a brighter day. He gave me a song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can sing in my heart joy bell. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me, he is to me. Brighter the way grows every day, walking the heavenly way. He gave me a song, 
a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praises to him, my king, he gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. A wonderful song he is to me, is to me. We better stop there. <laughs> I ran out of God. Oh. Okay. Thank you all.